In an ever-changing world, Life Changes Network presents a show about everything. We are broadcasting on frequencies of love, laughter, and understanding, illuminating new paths for new moments of healing and inspiration. As we, as one, strive for higher planes of existence and a better understanding of our true selves and the world in which we live, always remembering Life Changes. This is radio like you've never felt before with tonight's special guest, Austin Vickers. This is Life Changes with Filippo, and now your host, our MC, the master of change, Filippo Voltaggio. Thank you, Mark, and ciao, everyone. I am excited about having our guest, uh, Austin, on the show today, because right now his movie is screening in Los Angeles, and the movie that we're talking about and going to be talking a lot about is People versus the State of Illusion. And I got to see the movie, I got to see Austin, and right away I thought, we got to move things around so we can have him on and we can talk about it while, while this is is really hot and it's going to be hot for a while actually because these are the kind of topics that we need to be talking about more and more it's interesting how we can talk about them a lot but until they start sinking into our head sinking into our brains sinking into our dna we're just not going to get it and we need all of us to get it more and more and more and what i like about our guests too is that he got it. He started off not getting it in a sense. I'm not judging, but even he'll say that he's been stepping his, his own personal consciousness up and up and up. And I know that I'm working hard on doing the same, and we're all doing that here at Life Changes. And we're all hoping that you all uh, are, are joining us in, in, in doing this as well. And we know you are because we get your emails and your calls, and we appreciate that. Let me give you an example of, 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 of let me tell on myself, actually, um, because uh, I, I, I get to talk about this stuff. I write about this stuff. I get to uh, talk to some of the leaders uh, in the world of, of so much of this stuff. And um, and then I catch myself and say, holy shit, did I really just do that? And it's funny because this weekend was so much about friends. It was work, but also so much about friends. And I ended up seeing a lot of different friends over this particular weekend. And it started off um, on Thursday night or Friday. I saw one of my friends who has this really beautiful house up on the hill um, overlooking Los Angeles. Uh, she's got she's got this great house. She's got money. She's got all kinds of things going for her. She, it just, she's got a lot going for her, but it's so funny that every time I see her, I just see all the things that she's doing wrong. I, I mean, I, I think to myself, geez, if I had a house like this, I would do this, this, and this to this house and it would be so much better. And mind you, it would, but that that's beside the point. And then I think about how she does things in her life. And I thought, geez, if I had that kind of money or if I had those kind of looks or if I had that kind of lifestyle, or whatever, I would do so much. I would help so many people. I would yada, 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 yada. And so I was thinking of that. And then on Friday, I had this incident with a friend um, that rarely ever happens again, a completely different friend who said to me, Filippo, you do this wrong. And you do that wrong. And you're always doing this wrong. And you're always doing that wrong. And it was like this litany of all these things that I do wrong. And at, at the end of this phone call with this particular friend, I said to myself, you know what? I want more friends and, and maybe only friends who look for the good in me. Uh, because somebody, I, I could just tell from the way... He was saying this on the phone, that he was waiting for me to do it wrong so that he could give me this whole spiel. And I just wonder if the energy of his waiting for me to do it wrong actually made me do it wrong. In a moment where I was busy doing something else, I ended up falling into what he expected because maybe that's what he's putting out there. Now, I ended up doing something wrong and it wasn't that brave. And I'm happy to admit that I'm looking forward to changing that, that kind of thinking that led to that behavior. But it wasn't that grave a thing. But he couldn't wait for that to happen and, and was hoping it would. I just know it. And it did. And he's not a bad person. He's a really good person. It's just that he grew up with this DNA or something that, you know, tries to catch people on stuff and looks for what's wrong in people. And I said, that's it. I just want friends who look for the good in me. And if they see something else, they can bring it up and say, hey, by the way. But overall, they're looking for the good. And just as I thought that, 
I thought about my friend up on the hill. And I thought, what kind of a friend have I been to her? And haven't I been looking for all the things that she does wrong? And instead of saying, boy, if I had that kind of money, I would help all, all these other people. There are a lot of people she has helped, actually. And uh, for her to get to where she's gotten, she's uh, she came from nothing and has really worked hard. And she's got now what she's got, and she is who she is. She's, she's, she's going to be upping her game. I just know it. And I know that she'll be able to up her game even more if she's got a friend like me looking for what she's doing good as opposed to what she's doing wrong. So I actually kind of thank my friend, with, I'm not going to tell him, but I thank my friend for what happened over the, on the phone because it really helped me step up my game and I never want to be that kind of friend to anybody and I don't think any of us need those kinds of friends anymore. So that's one of the reasons why this is so perfect to have Austin on the show today after that just happened where I thought, okay, how do I get these new way of thinking um, even more ingrained in, in, in my mind and in my consciousness? And that's a little bit about what the film talked about, um, but only a little because the film talked about so many things. And as many films as I have seen on these kinds of subjects, I, I heard new things and new studies that I had never heard before. And it was really cool because I got to see our friend Joe Dispenza, who, of course, you know, we've had on the show uh, a couple times, actually, and got to interview him live a couple times um, and and a couple other people and it's so great to be learning from each other as friends uh, trying to help each other or actually helping each other helping each other step up our game as instead of looking for what we're doing wrong so with that uh, we're going to have Austin uh, with us in just a moment right after these words clean water is not enough Reverse osmosis, distilled water, and most bottled waters are devoid of naturally occurring minerals. They are acidic, unstructured, and hard to absorb and rob minerals from the body. Ionways ionizers produce a super abundant supply of powerful antioxidants in each glass. Ionized water has a reduced molecular cluster size and a negative charge, hydrating you up to six times better. Water from an Ionways ionizer will help you restore your body to its natural pH balance, boosting your vitality. An ionized water more effectively flushes acidic toxins from within your body. Drink the healthiest water available today. Ionways Water Systems, their water changes everything. To learn more about Ionways Water Systems and how you can own one today, visit our website at lifechangeswithfilippo.com and click on our sponsor page. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with your host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can visit us online via Twitter and Facebook and at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. Well, we're back, and I am Filippo, and I am excited about our guest tonight because not only did he put out this great film that I know is going to help a lot of people and a lot of people are going to see, but also because I feel like a kinship with him. Most of you know that I started off uh, at, at IBM and then uh, went on to do this and a couple other things that you all know about. So let me tell you about Austin, which you may not know. Now, Austin began his career as a trier lawyer in 18, in, in 18, in, in the 1700s, actually. <laughs> no, in uh, 1989. And this is, it's amazing to me because he uh, was working for one of the largest law firms in the world. Um, and then he moved on to international corporate law where he was responsible for, uh, what is it, uh, the, the legal affairs of over 15 countries. I mean, this is big stuff. Um, but in September of 2000, he resigned his position at one of the largest companies in the world doing, as as uh, we talk about here, corporate law. Um, why did he resign? What what What's it about? Hopefully we'll get to talk more about that tonight. But, but listen, he wanted to focus on his passion for, quote, guiding the vision and development of people and organizations. So he went on to create and be the director of what he calls the center. 
a leadership training facility in Phoenix, Arizona, um, and became also the co-founder of the Human Process Mastery Institute, a personal leadership uh, program as well. Um, and so now for the last decade, he has been entertaining and educating audiences across North America, delivering his keynote speeches uh, and his leadership training programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, working with some of the largest corporations again, um, only this time in a completely different way. And now he's going to be doing it yet again through his film, People versus the State of Illusion. So without further ado, here's Austin. Hi, Filippo. Thank you very much for having me on the show tonight. This is such a pleasure. As you can see, I, I already learned and I'm looking forward to learning more from, from what you know. Well, I appreciate that. I, I feel like a student as well. And, and it's, you know, all the material that I talk about is are things that I'm learning on a daily basis and practicing on a daily basis. And as you know, sometimes those of us who teach this material need to learn it the most. <laughs> You know, and that's one of the things that endeared us, uh, the audience, and, and myself to you is when uh, you said that during a, a Q&A, you actually said, you want to know what I'm working with? Watch the film. <laughs> that's everything in the film I'm working with. Well, I think that's right. I, I think that, you know, we become preoccupied with subjects that we want to teach because at some level or another, we've probably struggled with those issues. And, you know, my film is a movie about imagination and hope and the and the power of imagination and i certainly have been one of the most unimaginative people that i know at times in my life and it's still a struggle that i have when i'm confronting an obstacle or an apparent limitation or you know a circumstance or a person that doesn't seem to be helping so often i just become reactive as opposed to you know consciously trying to imagine a solution that's to the benefit of all so this is definitely stuff i work with and work on all the time uh i i love it and and you know uh one of one of the things that really got me was when you shared the story it was almost as an aside um and i wonder if uh you could share it in a nutshell the the story about um the the particular incident when that you it was actually I think it was your very first uh, trial um, with the young lady who asked you a question. Yeah, it was actually when I was first uh, starting out as a trial lawyer in Los Angeles, and I was on a trial that was the, at the time one of the largest sexual discrimination cases in U.S. history, and I was cross examining the woman on behalf of the company that I was representing. She was bringing suit against the company that I represented. And, you know, as a trial lawyer, you really learn how to push people's emotional buttons. And the reason you do that is because if they're lying, then you can get them to be emotional. You stand a much better chance at them, you know, stating something that is contrary to their lies or kind of getting caught up in their lies. But you also try to push their emotional buttons because even if they're not lying and they're telling the truth, when people are emotional, they're much more likely to say something that is stupid or not well thought out and which you could then twist to use kind of against them uh, in the course of the trial. So I had this woman up on the witness stand and I was doing exactly what I was supposed to do in my job as the trial lawyer cross-examining her and I was getting her more and more frustrated by pushing her emotional buttons and sure enough I got her to say something really stupid and it was particularly important for me because I actually was intuitively feeling like she was telling the truth mm. uh, on the witness stand but of course you know my job was to represent my client and all the partners of the law firm were there watching me do it and and so I you know, I'm cross-examining her. I get her to this emotional point. She blurts out something stupid, which I then use against her to ultimately win the case. And we do win the case. But what I wasn't really expecting is a question from her. And on our way out of the courtroom, she kind of cornered me. And you don't normally want to talk to people you know, that you've just beaten in trial and you really try to avoid it. But she kind of cornered me and I couldn't get out of it. And she looked me directly in the eyes and she asked me a question that I'll never forget, Filippo. I mean, she looked at me in the eyes and she asked me this question. She said, how did it feel today to destroy my dignity when you know that I was telling the truth? 
And it was such a powerful question. It really haunted me. I didn't answer it in that moment, but I did go back to my office. And for the next three months, I couldn't get that question out of my mind because she was absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I had compromised who I was. I had compromised my values. I compromised what I really believed in for the sake of, quote, unquote, my job and what I thought I was supposed to be doing. But it was against the very core of who I was. And at the end of the day, she was absolutely right. And I did feel like she was telling the truth. And it ultimately caused me to leave the practice of being a trial lawyer, you know, to, to go on to my corporate law job in the hopes at that point in my life that I, I wouldn't be forced into those same kinds of issues as an international corporate lawyer, but that didn't really prove to be true either. And I ultimately had to leave that as well to, to really focus on changing in people's lives. So I think that is such a great story. And I think it's even greater that you have shared it and hopefully will continue to share it because I feel like other people uh, will be able to empathize with that and they might be able to see where in their life they're doing that. Kind of like the story I shared uh, uh, in, during the monologue about uh, what my friend was doing to me and how I didn't like it. And then I thought, wow, I'm, I, I do that too. <laughs> yeah, there's a really good, in, in a lot of the work that I do teaching emotional intelligence and self-awareness with companies and executives, you know, a good standard rule of thumb is the minute you are thinking about somebody else's behavior, talking about somebody else's behavior, concerned with or aggravated by somebody else's behavior, it's never about the other person's behavior. It's always about something that's going on inside of us. And what the ego does as a de natural defense is it externalizes the issue so that we don't have to face ourselves. And, and, uh, and so, I'm, so I'm glad you're sharing that. I'm glad you're also sharing uh, the, the thoughts and work of uh, so many other people. Our, our friends, I, I can honestly say at this point, uh, like Dr. Joe Dispenza and Brenda Dunn, Debbie Ford, uh, is it Robert John and, and Dr. Thomas Moore, uh, Dr. Candace Pert, Dr. Peter Senge, uh, and, and, and on and on. Uh, what, um, wasn't that fun or was it? <laughs> I should ask. Oh, yeah, it was absolutely. I mean, you know, for an ex trial lawyer to be able to go into the homes or the offices of these experts, people who I've really studied and, and, you know, attended their workshops and read their works and their books for many, many years to go into their homes and offices and get to essentially, you know, cross-examine them or ask them any question I wanted to for the entire day was really an experience beyond belief and, and one of the most fun things I've ever been able to do in my life. <laughs> and now and now we all get to enjoy some of the fun you were having there uh as a matter of fact at the end of the movie you actually have some of the what was it uh no i'll tell you what it was um that really got me and i i, I like that you said i hope i'm not giving anything away here you asked them a question right I did. Yeah, it's a really fun question. And it's a it's a question I've used in all of my leadership training. It's a question I use with all of my clients, even from a company standpoint. And it's a message that's used to really hone people down in terms of what matters the most to them and what are they most passionate about. Because I think when we know that about who and what we are, then it's much easier to navigate the world of choices and align our choices with that purpose. So the question is simply, if you had the world's attention, but only for 60 seconds, what would, be, what would you say during that 60 seconds if everybody on the planet was listening to you? And I, I love that question because it literally forces people to, you know, get rid of all of the things that they want to say and really hone in on that thing that's the most important to them. And I asked each one of the experts in the film that question, and they answer the question at the very end of the film after it's ended when the credits are rolling. So it's a great piece to stay, stay around for. Yeah, I actually think it's uh, it, it was very clever and, and actually a poignant part in the film. Who knew that you could uh, learn so much just from the credits rolling? Um, 
<laughs> so yes, you definitely want to stay for that. Or I, I'm assuming, well, uh, I'm assuming that it's going to be available on DVD, but not too soon because it's in the theaters right now. We should tell people that it's being distributed by Samuel Baldwin and that you could be looking for it in, in your city. It's going to be, already has been in, in some major cities and like Portland and, uh, San Francisco, San Diego. It's in LA right now. It's going to be in Chicago, Dallas, Miami, New York. So, uh, everybody can go to, uh, uh, is it the state of illusion.com? It is. Yep. www.thestateofillusion.com. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of, one of the things I liked with the, that's a good example is, uh, you were able to get Samuel Goldwyn to distribute this. And so hopefully that'll set a precedent for other kind of, uh, other films like this to be able to be distributed, uh, to more of a mass market. But then, um, a lot of these films, except maybe The Secret and a little bit What what the Bleep, but don't get uh, national attention in magazines and newspapers much. And you're already in Scientific American. Yeah, we had a really great review by Scientific American Magazine, which we've actually posted on the website. And it was particularly meaningful for me as the filmmaker because one of the things I really wanted to do with this film was not include science that was controversial or, you know, really theoretical science that was only subject to interpretation. I actually excluded all of that kind of science and what I wanted to include in it were only very well established, although there, you know, many of them are new, but they're well established principles in neuroscience and physics and psychology because there is so much fascinating information and relevant science that is on the leading edge that most people are not aware of that I don't even think we have to get controversial. And so, you know, and I typically speak to business audiences, which really demand the facts and demand, you know, science that is well-grounded. And there is so much of it that um, it was nice to see Scientific American recognize the validity of the science in the film. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And I did read the article and liked it. And, and it was great because it reminded me of some of the points that I wanted to remember. Uh, I, I was actually thinking, I wish I had taken notes during the film. And then, um, and then something led me to the website and I clicked on Scientific American, the, the article and thought, ah, here are my notes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She does a really good job of pulling out many of the points in the film that we we're trying to highlight and it's you know it's just such a thrill when a reviewer that's reviewing your movie takes the time to really digest the film especially a film like ours which is so much more substantive than just a purely entertainment film and and gets it and understands it so it was a real thrill to read a review well, she she actually goes on to to not only say how she can use it, uh, how we can use it, uh, the reader can use it. The article is called "Want to Change Your Life? This Movie Might Inspire You" by Ingrid Wickelgren. Uh, you, you know, I, I, we're mentioning people here. I might as well mention uh, uh, this this funny little story, but. Um, and it'll get into how how the movie kind of um, how it grabs you. Um, uh, so. Uh, Betsy Chase, who we know and love, uh, is uh, helping publicize the movie with you. And uh, so she invited me to the film and I, I didn't uh, to the screening. So I, I didn't know anything about the film except for the fact that Betsy rarely invites me to, you know, a, a screening. And so when this came up, I'm like, OK, I got to go. And I went with uh, our producer, Dorothy Donahue and uh, L.A. traffic, blah, blah, blah. By the time we got there, we were maybe a minute in to the film like you had started it already it was a minute and we sat there and there was a a, a case going on the, the man a, a man looked like he might be going to jail and uh he was talking to his lawyer saying you can make this right and the lawyer says no we can't and not this time and and he says but i've got a child and and well so uh, you know and I, i'm starting to get into it but then I realized it's like, oh, wait a minute. We might have walked in the wrong theater before we get too involved in this because I was interested in what was going to happen. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Because I was expecting a regular docudrama kind of, you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> so I'm like, before we get too involved, we better find out if this is the right theater. And just as we were about to get up to go outside to make sure we were in the right theater, the, 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 the title comes up and we're like, hey, this is going to be a ride. 
<laughs> well, yeah, that was one of the things that we wanted to do with this film is, is really try to portray, you know, the science and the information in a distinct and unique way. And so the film is set up like a trial that really makes the viewer almost like a member of the jury or the judge in the case. And I'm presenting the case to them and, and presenting the science to them in much the same way that I would if I was doing a normal trial. But what we also then tried to do is, you know, by the end of the film, I think people in the viewing audience also come to realize that, you know, not only are they the judge or the juror in this trial, but it's actually their own life that's on trial. And, you know, the examination in this trial is really about them as much as it is about anybody. So, you know, they become very personally involved, hopefully, in, in this examination, which I really believe is probably the most important trial that any of us will ever experience in our lifetime. Exactly. You know, you reminded me of, uh, I hope you don't take offense to this, but the, the guy on People's Court um, who, you know, at the end, it, it talks about, uh, well, you know, what do you think? What do you think? Of course, he's probably not a lawyer. You are. Um, but, uh, I was thinking as I was making that analogy, I'm like, I could totally see this on TV. Okay, Austin, you got, uh, Samuel Golden to distribute it. Now, now make this into a TV show that we all can learn from. <laughs> well, if there's any producer friends out there that are looking for a new TV series, certainly have them give me a call. But, you know, it's funny when I actually made the film, I was originally making it for PBS and PBS has you know, seen the film and they want it, but we wanted to do a theatrical release because I think, you know, there's an entertainment and an emotionally compelling story that's a part of it um, that we thought was worthy of being in the theaters. But, you know, eventually one day, I think it, it could end up actually on PBS. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, as the film says, we just kind of have to think of it and believe it and, uh, um, uh... And, and and it shall be, or does the film doesn't say it exactly like that. How would the film say it? Well, I think what the film really says is don't underestimate the power of your imagination. You know, create an imagination. And one of the things I've learned from studying many great leaders over the years is that really great leaders never worry about the how of their vision. They only are focused on what that vision is and aligning the actions and choices of their organizations with that vision. And then they allow the how to unfold itself. And when you see people who are not imaginative and who are not creating great results in their life, sometimes they create so many limitations for themselves because they're almost insisting on understanding how the how is going to unfold before they're willing to articulate the vision and certainly to act in alignment with it. So what I always tell people is, look, don't worry about the how. Just focus and concentrate on your why and what your vision is and then allow the life to really conspire with you in that unfolding and you will be shocked and amazed at how magical that journey will become. Right. And you talk about journey. Uh, you take uh, the viewer through uh, a journey in the film. And if, if you don't want to answer this, you don't have to. But I, for half of the film, at least, I thought this was a true story. Well, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, go into it. And one of the things I've certainly learned in coaching and in working with individuals and companies over the years is that, you know, we have a tendency to externalize issues. It's kind of like what I was saying in the beginning of the show where we like to focus on other people and things outside of ourselves rather than looking at ourselves. So one of the techniques I use in working with groups or organizations or individuals is to ask them, you know, what is one of the biggest problems or behaviors that you see in the world around you? You know, whether that's in your own personal life, you know, what's the one characteristic or value that seems to show up all the time in your life with people around you that really bothers you? And I ask that question because, you know, people can easily externalize an issue. So that's a very non-threatening question to ask them. And everybody can say, well, yeah, I, I've noticed over the course of my life that people around me are always controlling or they're always judgmental or they come with a lot of anxiety or fear or whatever the trait is. Mm. But, I, but I ask the question because in the identification of that external issue, what they're really doing is telling me about themselves. Takes and one that, to know one. Yeah, exactly. And then my <laughs> my job is, as the coach or the trainer is to really help them understand how they are being that 
exact attribute or value and how to ultimately, you know, become more imaginative and find their way out of that limitation. And when they do, ironically, but not so ironically, life around them changes also because ultimately life is only a reflection of who we are. Brilliant. I love it. I love it and hate it at the same time, but I love it more than I hate it. Um, and we'll love it even more. And actually, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, I would love to ask you about the, uh, the, the chick experiment. And we'll just leave it at that uh, until we come back. But in the meantime, I want to make sure that everybody knows that we're talking to Austin Vickers, who is the producer and protagonist of the film People vs. the State of Illusion. It's going to be uh, in theaters near you if you're near a big city, uh, at least for starters. So you can go to thestateofillusion.com, www.thestateofillusion.com of illusion.com to find out when it's going to be in a theater near you. And we'll be back with Austin Vickers right after this. There are self-help seminars costing thousands of dollars guaranteeing miraculous transformations. There are compelling speakers and life-changing weekend experiences where you can walk on fire. They all deliver revelations that guarantee you'll come back for the more expensive revelations filled with even greater wonder next month on Fiji. We get addicted to positive, heartfelt, expensive theater. What we really need is a jumpstart, an awakening, someone who can give us a reminder that everything we need lies within. Through inspiration and practical knowledge, Dorothy Donahue helps people get grounded and motivated, inspired and energized. It's not just words and affirmations and the power of intention. It's a mindset brought about by a tangible, transcendental experience, an audiovisual, physical, spiritual experience that helps us realize we transform ourselves. We get tools to become the conscious co-creators of lives of unlimited potential. Find out more. Go to DorothyDonahue.com. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with our host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can hear tonight's show and all our past shows, which include luminaries such as David Wilcock, Mariel Hemingway, Giorgio Sukalos, Marcy Shymoff, and Shadow Stevens on our archive page at our website at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O dot com. Remember, you can also connect with us via Twitter and Facebook and now in our own community at lifechangesnetwork.com where real people come together to share real life in real time. That's lifechangesnetwork.com. I am Filippo, and our guest today is Austin Vickers, who is the producer and protagonist in the film People vs. the State of Illusion. And just before the break, well, we were talking about all kinds of things we can't recap, but I did ask if he would tell us the, chicks, the, the chick experiment story. Yeah, it's yeah, a it's really, really fantastic, fantastic experiment, experiment. Um, um, that, that I came, I came across, across when I lived, I lived in, in London, London, England, England many, many, many years, years ago. ago. And, and the experiment, the experiment is, is about, uh, or was accomplished by this researcher by the name of Rene Pioche. And what Rene Pioche did that was so interesting is he built this arena where a computer-generated robot could move randomly. And he put the robot in this like arena that was also sensitized to be able to create a digital readout on a computer so the computer could literally track the movements of this um, random movement generator and of course ran the movement generator over the course of about 12 hours and as you might expect over the course of that time the computer movement generator covered essentially the entire distance of this arena but then he did a really interesting thing he hatched uh, about 100 baby chicks next to the random movement generator in a way that would make the baby chicks think that it's its mother. It's called imprinting, and it's kind of well-known in animal science that baby chicks immediately imprint and bond with the first thing they see and experience when they're hatched. So he made these baby chicks believe that the random movement generator was its mother, and then he put them in a cage where they could see into this arena where the random movement generator operated, but they couldn't get to it, um, even though they wanted to because they thought this thing was its mother. And then when he ran the experiments again, the random movement generator 
actually moved in the arena, in the side of the arena closest to the baby chicks and didn't run at all in, in the other half of the arena, you know, away from the baby chicks. And repeated this study, obviously, with, you know, as a control study against chicks that were not hatched next to the robot, in which case the robot returned back to its normal behavior. So he, he really showed with the experiment that the intention of these baby chicks could even affect something like an inanimate object like this computer-generated robot. I, I think it's so well illustrated in the film and, and uh, just seeing the film just for those kinds of things alone. And there are a lot of them that at least for me, it was like, aha, the rahas all over the place. And, and one of one of the most uh, important one uh, t- for me, uh, besides the, the, the curiosity of the chick one, which I think is a great story and great experiment, um, one of the most important ones to, to, to me to, to focus on uh, and learn more about, actually, if you want to share, is, is stress and how it affects us in, in ways that we normally don't think about. Yeah, and it really is. I mean, we portray a number of facts in the beginning of the movie that show some of the cultural problems associated with stress. For example, the American Psychological Association went back over 100 years examining the death records of every American that's ever died and concluded at the result of at the conclusion of the study that actually over 50% of deaths in the United States are attributable to behavioral social factors, the majority of which are rooted in stress. Um, you know, so that's a, it's a pretty eye-opening fact when, yeah. we, when we really hear the evidence for that. Um, another fact, for example, despite all of the armed conflicts in the world, more people will actually die from suicide every year than from all armed conflicts around the world combined. So, you know, the ultimate kind of giving up on life and allowing life to get to us and to the point where we want to take our lives because we've lost hope is still a really, you know, epidemic problem in not only our culture, but in cultures around the world. So these are all, you know, not to mention the divorce rates and the rates where people lose their jobs and all of those things that cause stress on a normal day-to-day basis. So it's really a massive problem that needs addressing, and we try to do that in the film. Yeah, and... and um can you, um, I, we do want people to see the film because it, it, it sometimes just giving somebody the answer without a process, um, it d- doesn't uh, always uh, work as effectively. But are there a couple things you can give us that we can uh, be reminded of when we do see the film again? Well, I think one of the most important things that we try to document in the film is to help people understand the, me- the mechanics of perception. You know, in the, because we're in the digital age now, it's much, it, that part. Yeah, it's, it's much easier to ascertain the actual amount of information we receive through the senses. And scientists tell us today that it literally amounts to the billions of pieces of information and bits of information that we receive on a daily basis. And yet what we're really capable of bringing into our conscious awareness is, you know, less than two or 3,000 thoughts in a given day. Well, when you mathematically compare those numbers, it tells us that our view of reality is actually closer to zero as a percentage than even one one-thousandth of one percent of the total information that's available to us on yeah. a daily basis. So, you know, just understanding that fact has to lead somebody to the conclusion that we see such a limited and minute fraction of the total information that's available that what we see and the way that we see life is really more indicative of who we are than what it is we're actually observing. Because the truth is is that life has so much information that you could literally see an infinite number of views. And so with that understanding... I think it can help people look at their life and go, well, is the way I think, is the experience that I have really serving me? You know, is it creative? Is it imaginative? Am I passionate about my view of life? Does it make me want to wake up in the morning and, and approach that day in a joyful and compassionate way? And if the answer is no, then you know, it's incumbent on us to do something about it. And the film tells us how and what we can actually do. And Austin, kind of like my story at the beginning of the show, if 
if I was focused on the the one percent that my friend was doing wrong, that's all I would see. Yeah, no question. And we also talk about a principle in the film called the content to process shift. And what we tell people and, and illustrate for them through the examples and the dialogue and the narrative is is to have people pay much less attention to the things that they think about and the content of their lives and more attention to the process of that content or the way that and our patterns of thinking in response to it. So what I loved, Filippo, about your example was what you became aware of was the process. Like you noticed the process your friend used with you, which was you know, seemingly negative and pointing out all the things that you could have been doing and weren't doing. And then you took that learning and recognized that you too had that same pattern of thinking as it applied to your female friend on the hill. And because you recognized that that's not uh, who you want to be and it's not the imaginative, you know, constructive and kind of positive person that you wanted to be, you could recognize that there was a shift in perception and a shift in imagination about her that you needed to do. And that's, that's all we can ever ask for. You know, it's not about becoming perfect or never making mistakes. It's just about practice and learning to become imaginative in our lives and, and, and just, you know, learning and growing on a daily basis. Absolutely. And, and it makes me think about how other people might have perceived her as uh, this person who did all this good. And, and so then one can say, well, uh, but I see her the real way. Well, if I only <laughs> see a small, almost zero percent of all the billions, uh, 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 billions of bits of information or whatever that's out there, if I'm seeing this and somebody else is seeing almost zero, but let's just call it one percent of something else entirely different, um, we're looking at two different worlds. Oh, no question. And, you know, I love it when people say that, when, you know, we make our judgments about somebody. Because the truth is, you know, I'm not who Filippo thinks I am. I'm not who my ex-wife thinks I am. I'm not who my children think I am. I'm not who anybody who I've ever encountered think that I am. I'm the sum total of all of those things. And it is impossible for you or any other individual on this planet to understand and comprehend the sum total because every time you are interacting with me, you can only interact with me through your goggles, through your Mm -hmm. perception of me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, by definition, the minute we exercise a judgment about who somebody is or what we think they are, we're really more castigating ourselves and defining who we are than we are really defining them. And, you know, that's something to we should be careful about, I think. Uh, absolutely. And just for the record, I think you're great. So there's that. Uh, and <laughs> well, that makes you great, too, then, I guess. <laughs> Certainly in my book. Awesome. And handsome, too. Uh, so, you know, there's this that. This will be the Mutual Admiration <laughs> Society, right? We'll tell each other how bright and smart and great we all are. And maybe that's the way it should be, or at least in, in the world that I'm envisioning. So um, why not? Um, you know, and, and, uh, I, I have, uh, we, we have a short uh, time left, but I, I have a one, one question for you. Um, if, if you had the world's attention, but for only 60 seconds, <laughs> what a great question, Filippo. It's very <laughs> intelligent. Great, great question. I got it from a friend of mine who's a really bright guy. Austin <laughs> Well, listen, I, you know, I do address that myself um, at the end of the film. And what I would really say to people as I go around and I speak and I hear people talk about, you know, today's economy and how bad it is and the political environment that seems like a mess and how much fear and anxiety and, you know, all the world's problems. What I always like to remind them is, look, we are at a point in history that I believe there has never been a point in history better than today to turn our imaginations into reality. I mean, 60 years ago, you know, a black man couldn't ride on the front of a bus in this country, and today he serves as the president of the United States. You know, a college kid in his dormitory goes from eating top ramen every night because he doesn't have any money with an idea that four and a half years later turns him into one of the world's richest billionaires, and I'm talking about the founder of Facebook. You know, I ask audiences all the time, when would you rather be alive 
in this world if you had a medical problem in the history of this world than right now. I mean, we have more science available to us. We have more communication devices available to us. We have more people with willing and open hearts available to us and more potential allies today to turn any of our imaginations into reality than ever before in the history of the world. So I think we have to really be conscious about how we're imagining, not underestimate that power of our imagination, and really do our best to um, put our minds and our actions into a framework where we can turn our imaginations into reality. Well, there it is. And you say all that and so much more in the film. And the film we're talking about is People versus the State of Illusion. We've been talking to Austin Vickers. You can learn more about him by going to thestateofillusion.com. And Austin, um, there people can also get a hold of you uh, for your keynote addresses and workshops and all that too, right? It is, yeah. We have a, a button under the... The movie's website that talks about the programs that we're currently offering. And I'm not really teaching a lot of them at the moment just because I've been traveling with the film and its openings. But very soon the movie will be out on video on demand and in DVD. And I'm certainly happy to, you know, engage in speaking events to talk about the power of imagination because I'm, I'm so passionate about it. So. Yes, uh, and uh, that was actually something that I was going to mention. It's funny because in the film you're you're just like very very lawyerish, and then <laughs> in person you were more like entertainerish. And uh, so to see the, the the two, and maybe on screen someday you'll you'll be able to use both. Well, well, yeah, maybe I, I was actually playing the role, obviously, of the lawyer in in the film, so. I didn't want to bring out my uh, the more jovial side, which I do like to bring out when I'm, you know, public speaking and whatnot, because I think people respond more emotionally to that. But uh, yeah, so thank you for noticing, though, Philippe. I appreciate that. Well, you're absolutely welcome, and thank you for being on the show with us. I know you're really busy out there promoting the film, and I'm glad you chose us as one of the ones to help get your message out as well. Well, we certainly, I certainly appreciate the work that you're doing as well, and it's always you know, a pleasure and uh, to work with a, a kindred spirit and somebody else who's all, uh, also, you know, working to effectuate change in the world. So I applaud you for your efforts as well, Filippo. All right. And the Mutual uh, Admiration Society continues. And with that, uh, I thank you, Austin, and look forward to connecting with you again in the near future. That sounds great. Thanks again. All right. Ciao, ciao. We'll be back with our producer's wrap with our producer, Mark Lejour, right after this. Life Changes with Filippo is a premier radio show presented by Life Changes Network, which is a company whose team has dedicated their lives not only to positive change, but to helping others observe and embrace, honor, and even celebrate their own changes, thus enabling a more positive, inspired life and helping to create a more positive and inspired world. From everyday people to corporate giants, celebrities, and children, we are here to help and to serve. With heart and experience, we bring our message and positive intent into your home or corporate office and even through appearances on your favorite shows. If you wish to learn more about Life Changes Life Coaching and a private consultation with one of us, corporate event appearances, or if you would like us to appear on your radio or TV shows, visit lifechangeswithfilippo.com and click on our representation page. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with your host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can visit us online via Twitter and Facebook and at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. Well, I am Filippo, and this is the Producer's Wrap with Mark Lejure as well. And we've been talking to Austin Vickers of the film People vs. the State of Illusion. What a great name. That's a great name, but speaking of names, really, Doug Llewellyn, you could you Doug Llewellyn. That's you couldn't right. have made it, Wapner. You got to give him Doug Llewellyn. <laughs> that's right. That's right. The People's <laughs> Court. This is Doug. Llewellyn. That's funny. I'd forgotten. That's right. I didn't say Wapner. Well, it was Judge Wapner, right? You're right. That's, that's right. What I mean. <laughs> Thank you, and that's what a good producer does. <laughs> So one thing that uh, that I thought was really interesting uh, that kept popping to mind, a friend of mine, and maybe it's a good reference point for those that, that are exploring this topic, a friend of mine uh, had given me a book a while back, 
uh, called Illusions by Richard Bach, who also did Jonathan Living, Livingston Seagull, I think. Uh-huh. You know more for that one. Uh-huh. But, uh, but a lot within that story oh, and the way he oh, relays oh. is... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the sound effect. That's the seagull. Yeah, that guy. The, the living stunned seagull. The living stunned seagull. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm well, sure there's a really back. good point. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it, it, you know, there's a, a, a number of, of reference points that kind of, uh, in, in that, that fictitiously educational story mirror some of what, uh, Austin was saying. Um, but the, the one thing I honed in on uh, was interesting enough in that, I, you know, I always draw comparisons to, to, between consciousness and the technology world, the internet, the connectivity, and, and, and of course many do nowadays, um. But I, I think the more that we learn, the more that we, you know, that the, the mirroring of the way our our communication is in this electronic age um, is being evidenced as such through our heart connectivity and, and the way we process information connected to the greater universe. Mm. Um, but he was talking about how you really need to suspend your desire to know the how. Yeah. And I really like that. Not only do I like that, it's funny, we had a phrase that we used in, uh, in one of my prior companies where we would call it hiding the how. Oh. And it was really about trying to take out the complexity uh, for the consumer so that, they, they, that it didn't matter how complex it was, how wonderful the solution was, how much faster, brighter, stronger, etc. And I think that one of the companies that did that best uh, on the planet, at least recently, is Apple. Mm. They did a great job of hiding the how and giving a product that was easy and slick and 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 intuitive for everyone, right? When you talk about iTunes and you know that's part yeah. of the reason it worked is is they hid the how and they made it very simple and but yet it did so much, it does so much, and and I I, I think that's such a great analogy that he brought up to us and imagination and consciousness, and I know I'm probably more so than most in my desire to know the how, you know, it's, <laughs> so, so I do get hung up on that, um, at times. And, and that's been part of my process is to learn how to suspend th- that search a bit to play with the, just the, the being and the imagining and the fun aspect of it rather than working on the, you know, the metrics or the mechanics. You, you don't only have to know the how, you have to know the who. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, the guy on people's court is enough. But no, you have to look him up and find out exactly who. But, um, but no, I'm, I'm glad you brought up that, um, that because it reminds me of an exercise that we did uh, back at IBM. Um, when I was working at IBM, I remember that there was this exercise um, where we were told that something was possible, and and so um, and so we figured uh, we figured out how to do it. Then we were told that something was impossible, and then it, we broke out into teams, and none of us could figure out how to do it, and we all concluded that it wasn't doable. And then when the instructor said, no, it is doable, but none of you could figure out that it was doable because I implanted in you that it was not. That it, and, and so it, it's, it's interesting how we just went, yeah, she's right. We proved her right. It's not possible. Well, how, you know, <laughs> you're touching on, I think, the core essence of, of life and education and of each one of us as kids. You know, how, how many people are doing something different or not doing what it is that they're here to do or would aspire to do or dream to do because someone right. told them it's impossible. Right, right. Or that they're too slow or too short or not good looking enough or not this or not you that. You can't make a living singing. You can't be make. you'll be a starving artist. But that's what I think is interesting in terms of the internet and it being the great equalizer and how it has shattered some of those beliefs and started to reprogram people's perceptions of that because what used to be controlled by a very small group of people, a very small group of companies, if you will, 
um, it, you know, in terms of making that barrier so high and who's going to get in and who, how you're supposed to look and how you're supposed to act. And we're going to package you this way and we're going to sell you and we're going to put you on the our magazines and, and, and on our radio shows and everything else. And then suddenly all, you know, sudden comes a Susan Boyle or a Paul right. Potts or any one of these, right. you know, auditions that went viral. And uh, the the latest show, The Voice, is great that way because yeah. they, the initial um, uh, audition is with their backs turned, right? And it's right. all about the voice and what they're feeling as opposed to what they're seeing and, and what might be considered presentable. And therefore, people are falling in love with these people for who they really are and the talent that they really have as opposed to the packaging that had been handed to them. And, you know, and actually, it, it it's not just the people who don't think they look good enough or the people that think they're too fat or the people that don't think they're smart enough. And or, or I, 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 it's not just the people who 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 think that they're not who think that they're misfits. Let's just put it that way. I'm, I'm making a point. And I'm not doing it very well because this is it's, it's a it's a touchy subject. And it just happened this weekend. I was just telling you before we went on the air, come to think of it, um, about this beautiful woman. I mean, she was beautiful and intelligent and she had a great body and she has so much going for her and she is bright. I mean, they were talking about how she's a a doctor and uh, on her final exam before becoming a a doctor, she, she got 98%. um, And she got pissed off because she's like, go back and tell me which ones I made a mistake on because I think I got them all right. And then they told her which ones it was. And then she taught them why they were wrong. And then they gave her a hundred percent and they changed the test. That's how smart this woman is. And she was on stage in front of like a thousand people. She gave this great presentation. And I went up afterwards and told her that I would love to have her on the show. And what was I telling you, Mark? She had tears in her eyes and said, I'm so sorry. I totally flubbed that up. I'm usually a lot more eloquent. And she went on about how terrible she was on stage. Mm. And I'm telling you, she was drop dead gorgeous and had so much going for her. But in her eyes, she was a complete failure at that moment. Interesting, and and that obviously because there's some sort of programming in there exactly. that she's relying on. It was probably a big deal for her to get up there and 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 make that uh, presentation, and uh, therefore she wants to go you know back as you were saying you know, back off stage. You know, rehearse it, practice it more, and, and, and not give it until then. So how many people don't get to hear that until she's ready again? Speaking about people that don't get to hear it, speaking about The Voice, we got to enjoy you singing on Facebook. Mm, yeah, I did share a song. That's, That's really cool. Um, I know that not our listeners are your friends, and they can't hear that, but hopefully, maybe I'll put it on my Facebook. But, but hopefully, well, it was a song that I made for my dad, and, and that's the way it was uh, uh, appropriate to share it. To, uh, to friends, so it was, uh, it was nice to get the comments and feedback. Yeah, so, well, then hopefully there'll be something else that we can share with the rest of the world real soon. Um, so, because, you know, there again, it's like uh, people, actually, the reason that comes up to mind is because people, some of people's comments that, that have shared with me, it's like, what took him so long to put something like that out? His voice is amazing. And it's like, well, we're either busy with other stuff or we think that that's not you know, yeah, we don't have enough time on this show for, uh, for that because there's a whole story as to why I stopped singing and why I wasn't in a place to share it. So yeah, there's definite parallels because I had to overcome overcome that programming in order to to be willing to share it and to see or be able to even listen to myself in a way that that I accepted that others would accept it or appreciate mm. it or love it or whatever. Mm. And love it they have, and 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 love it they will more. So thank you for giving us that teaser and the song, and then hopefully we'll get to share more of the story and more songs uh, soon. In the meantime, that has been our producer's wrap. Thank you for sharing that with us. And so I thank Mark Lejour and uh, Dorothy Donahue, our producers, and our engineer, uh, Seth Hendricks. I am Filippo Voltaggio, thanking you for being part of the change that we all wish to see in this world and part of our show. Uh, We look forward to seeing you again next week. Same time, same place. Ciao. You have been listening to Life Changes with Filippo with the master of change, Filippo Voltaggio. Listen live every Monday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on the BBS Radio Network and visit us online at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. Today's show has been made possible in part by our sponsors, Ionways Water Systems, 
Change Your Water, Change Your Life, and Love and Miracles with Dorothy Lee Donahue. To learn more about them, visit the sponsor page of our website. Once again, join us here next week as we consciously explore and embrace the only constant, life changes. Change the world, now's the time. Now's the time.